Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at First Federated Church on this 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, known as Armistice Day and also now as Veterans Day. I encourage you to read the various announcements that are in your home edition. This morning, after the announcements, we will have the Armed Forces uh, tribute. <clears throat> As in past years, the various songs of the uh, Armed Forces will be played. If you were in that particular branch uh, serving uh, this country, we invite you to stand as that uh, piece of the tribute is played. Also, you'll notice that the cover bulletin uh, is uh, a, a painting from the uh, World War I with a piper go going across a battlefield. There's an explanation about the uh, piper and that particular battlefield. This morning during our coffee fellowship, we get to be served by our host, who are the kindergarten, first, and second grade students of our Sunday school program. So, tip big when you see them, <laughs> compliment freely, and be thankful. Uh, uh, Annie Rain King is going to make an announcement, and then we will uh, continue with the Armed Forces Tribute. Good morning. Um, this year, I am in charge of planning the senior high mission trip, so I just want to make um, another announcement. I made one last week. We are going to have a meeting on November 18th, which is next Sunday, after the congregational meeting. We'll meet up in the creation station just for a little bit to give you some information. People who are kids who can come are anyone who is currently in eighth grade or a freshman through senior in high school. So um, there's a wide um, grade band that can come. We're really excited. We're going to go to Minneapolis, Minnesota this year. Year, and we leave on June 23rd. So if you want to find out more information, please come to that meeting next week um, in the Creation Station just for a little bit after the congregational meeting. And then tonight we also have senior highs, and tonight we are making gingerbreads, um, getting ready for the gingerbread house celebration. So um, get ready to cook tonight if you're a senior high who comes. Thank you.
Our call to worship this morning comes from the 127th Psalm. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for God gives to his beloved sleep. Lo, sons and daughters are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons and daughters of one's youth. Happy is the individual who has their quiver full of sons and daughters. They shall not be put to shame. And when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Amen. Let us join, stand and join in singing our opening hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King, number 699. Rejoice, the Lord is King, the risen Christ our Lord. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. God's reign can never fail, Christ rules on earth and hell. The keys of death and hell are unto Jesus' name. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. As I noted earlier that this is the 100th anniversary of the, Earl, the end of World War I, it was the war to end all wars. We still long for that day when swords shall be turned into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks and men and women will no longer learn the art of war. I invite you to join in our responsive prayer that commemorates this day. Together, let us pray. Father of all, remember your holy promise and look with love on all your people, living and departed. On this day, we especially ask that you would hold forever all who suffered during the First World War, those who returned scarred by warfare, those who waited anxiously at home, and those who returned wounded and disillusioned, those who mourned, and those communities that were diminished and suffered loss. Remember, Lord, those whose stories were unspoken and untold. Sure, remember them. Come in your kingdom. Remember, Lord, those whose minds were darkened and disturbed by the memories of war. Remember, Lord, those who suffered in silence and those whose bodies were disfigured by injury and pain. Remember, too, those who are. And as you remember them, remember us, O Lord. Grant us peace in our time and a longing for the day when people of every language, race, and nation will be brought into unity of Christ's kingdom. This we ask in the name of the same Lord, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Now I'd like to invite the children to come forward for the children's message. The Kyrie is, Lord, have mercy. And as they were singing, I could not help but to remember that uh, hymn that Harry Emerson Fosdick wrote in the height of uh, World War II when he wrote the great hymn, God and Father of Mankind, Forgive Our Foolish Ways. Appropriate for this the centennial of the end of World War I. This is not a time of obligation. It is not a time of have to. It is a time of opportunity. It is a time when we can set aside a percentage of our own income in order to do the work of the hands of the Church of Jesus Christ through this congregation. It is our way of alleviating the suffering and the misery of the least, the last, and the lost. As we look at those, as we, as we remember those who are homeless, those who sleep on the streets, those who find themselves without a job, without, without hope, 
It is also a time when we can celebrate our opportunity to uh, provide Christian education for our youth, to touch the lives of children in our community from our, with our preschools, the First Federated Church, to worship in a beautiful facility, and to have a campus ground that is a blessing, a place of holiness and awe within the community of Peoria. This is our opportunity to respond to God's grace and God's goodness in our lives with our tithes, our alms, and our offerings. Therefore, let us come with glad and happy hearts. Would you join me in the spirit of prayer? Our Lord God, we ask that you bless the offering that we will give this day and grant to us the wisdom we need to use it to do the work of your kingdom in our own community across this nation and around the world. Help us to alleviate uh, suffering and the effects of stupid poverty. Help us to minister to the least, the last, and the lost, and especially the children. All of these things we pray in your name. Amen.
We want to join me in a spirit of prayer. Our Lord God, we ask that you stir the complacency of our hearts and set them on fire so that we can hear and obey your word. Give us the insights that we need to have to be faithful disciples. And let us set aside any prejudices or preconceived notions. In your name we very humbly pray. Amen. Today's Old Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Ruth. First from chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. It's time I found you a husband who will give you a home and take care of you. You have been... been picking up grain alongside the women who work for Boaz, and you know he is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be threshing the grain. Now you know he is. Er, now take a bath and put on some perfume, then dress in your best clothes. Go where he is working, but don't let him see you until he has finished eating and drinking. Watch where he goes and spend the night. Then, when he is asleep, lift the cover and lie down at his feet. He will tell you what to do. Ruth answered, "I'll do whatever you say." Secondly, from chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Boaz married Ruth, and the Lord blessed her with a son. After his birth, the woman said to Naomi, Praise the Lord. Today he has given you a grandson to take care of you. We pray that the boy will grow up to be famous everywhere in Israel. He will make you happy and take care of you in your old age, but he is the son of your daughter-in-law, and she loves you more than seven sons of your own would love you. Naomi loved the boy and took care of him. The neighborhood women named him Obed, but they called him Naomi's boy. When Obed grew up, he had a son named Jesse, who later became the father of King David. Grace, thank you very much. Grace is one of our confirmation students and takes a lot of uh, courage to come up here and to be a liturgist. And so kudos, you did an excellent job. And uh, next Sunday, by the grace of God, we'll have an additional confirmation student serve as a liturgist here. So we are richly blessed by this confirmation class. I think of six students, is that, is that right? Six students. I had the privilege last week of being able to meet with them, and uh, we are very, very richly blessed. I'm going to ask you to join me in the spirit of prayer, if you would. Our Lord God, we pause, we bow before you in a moment of silent prayer to lift up the joys and and the concerns of our hearts. Lord God, we gather together to worship in the midst of the changing seasons. We are unsure if winter is here to stay and if the temperatures will continue to plummet or if we'll have some respite. But this is your world and your creation. You created it good. There are seasons in our own lives that these seasons remind us of. Help us to count the number of our days so that we can, make, that we can gain hearts of true wisdom. Lord God, we are thankful for the young men and women whom you have called and led into a confirmation class. We ask that you be with them in their time of study. We are thankful that you have chosen to add to our number a fellow disciple later on this morning. We celebrate his faith commitment. We are thankful for those men and women who have served and fought the good fight and run the race and completed this part of life. We especially remember those families who were touched by the tragedy of World War I. For every village and hamlet in England and throughout Europe that still has a marker bearing the names of those soldiers who never came home. Our Lord God, we pray for our nation. We pray for the President of the United States and the Governor of the State of Illinois, the Mayor of the City of Peoria, and all of our surrounding communities. We pray for all of those who have you, you have placed in authority throughout this land, all the governors and the senators and the representatives. We pray for the leaders and the rulers of this world. We pray that your Holy Spirit will touch their hearts so that the day will come when we no longer learn the art of war, that swords and spears will be turned into pruning hooks and plowshares. Lord God, we pray for ourselves and for our own church family. Grant your healing touch, we very humbly pray. We especially lift up uh, this morning um, Dee Frankel, that you would be with her and surround her with a sense of your love and peace and grace. 
We pray for those members of our congregation who will be undergoing treatments in the coming days and weeks. We live our lives under your providential care, and so often we forget that. Lord, keep us ever mindful of your divine care and of your love that will never let us go. Let us put aside enmities that may separate us from one another. Help us to see each other as a child of God created in your divine image. All of these things we pray in the name of Jesus, whom we call to be the Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our uh, gospel lesson this morning, from, what's, from whence the sermon will come, is from the 12th chapter. And in his teaching, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to go about in long robes and have salutations in the marketplace and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feast." Who devour widows' houses for a pretense make and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched a multitude putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, her whole living. May God add understanding to the reading of that word. Amen. Would you join me once again in the spirit of prayer? May the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable into your sight, O Lord, and may those things said this morning that are true be engraved upon every heart, and anything said that is false, may it be quickly forgotten and cause no harm. In your name we very humbly pray. Amen. I listen to a lot of uh, Simon Sinek and um, uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, and Malcolm in one of his uh, podcasts or one of his talks says that oftentimes he has to give titles of his speeches weeks and months in advance, and any resemblance to his actual remarks and the title are merely coincidental. And so that's how it is this morning. The sermon title, for those of you who wish to keep track of these things, is called The Greatest Gift. The text is from the 43rd verse of that gospel lesson I just shared. And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. In 1921, four graves of four unknown soldiers were exhumed from four different cemeteries in France. United States Army Sergeant Edward Younger, who was wounded in combat during that war and received the Distinguished Service Medal, was chosen to select a soldier for burial at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers in Arlington, Virginia. The four exhumed remains were placed in identical caskets and set side by side. Younger chose the third casket from the left by placing a spray of white roses upon it. That chosen soldier was transported to the United States on the USS Olympia, where he was interned in the tomb of the unknown soldiers. The other three remains were reburied at the Meuse Argonne American Cemetery in France. And the inscription at the tomb of the unknown soldiers reads, Here rest in honored glory an American soldier known but to God. In subsequent wars, World War II, two other remains were added, one from the European and one from the Pacific theaters, as was a fourth soldier added after the Korean conflict. The remains of a fifth soldier were added after the Vietnam War, but because of advanced DNA technology, his remains were identified and his family re-interred him in a different location. As I read about Armistice Day, I was struck by the fact that the Gospels are largely driven by those people whose names are known only to God. For example, the Magi from the East. Tradition assigns them names, but Scripture does not. They worshipped the baby Jesus and brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then there was the child in John's Gospel 
who gave up his small fish and his inexpensive barley loaves to the disciples so that Jesus could use those meager resources to feed the 5,000 and have bread left over. And we mustn't forget the woman who came into the Pharisee's house and interrupted a dinner party and fell at Jesus' feet and poured expensive nard upon those feet and then washed and then dried his feet with her own hair. And of course, the widow in today's text who dropped two small coins into the offering box. The Revised Standard says the two coins equaled one penny, but in reality, the two coins were the smallest of denomination. They equaled one-sixteenth of a penny in our own day. Now, you may be asking yourself, what do these characters have in common? And the answer is simple. Extravagant generosity. Recall the scene in our gospel lesson. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He is get, growing, getting closer to being crucified. The die has already been cast. Just prior to this, he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he replied, the greatest commandment is this, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul. But he didn't stop there. He said, there's a second commandment likened to it that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments, all of the other commandments rest. The love of God and the love of neighbor go hand in hand. As the first epistle of John asks, how can you say you love God whom you have not seen if you do not love your neighbor whom you have seen? Years ago, uh, my father was estranged from a sister for a long period of time, for 15 or so years. And I remember after I had been uh, a pastor for a number of years, I was talking to him one day and I said to him, I said, you know, Dad, it strikes me that as central as forgiveness is to the teaching of Jesus, walk the second mile, turn the other cheek, pray for your enemies, as central to the teaching of of Jesus that forgiveness is, it would not surprise me at all that when this life draws to a close and we enter into the pearly gates of heaven, that the gatekeeper is the person or the people from whom we are estranged here on earth. And then we will have to decide if we will have reconciliation on the other side of the grave or if we'll have reconciliation on this side of the grave. And if we refuse it here, and if we refuse it there, then God does not send us into hell, but we decide we would rather be in hell than be reconciled. Now, whether or not my words had any effect on him, I do not know, but for the last five years of his life, he was reconciled to all three of his sisters, and they had many, many happy memories. Jesus sat down in our gospel lesson opposite the temple treasury, and he watched worshipers put their offering in the collection box. There would oftentimes be a bell rung when someone put something in the alm box. And almost everyone that day put in an exact amount based on the law of the tithe and how it was to be calculated, gross or net or whatever the calculations were in that day. But this poor widow was different. The amount of her offering was not great compared to the amount that other people were putting in. As a matter of fact, as the gospel lesson told us, it was the smallest of, of two of the smallest coins in circulation in that day. By law, she could have kept one of the coins, but she did not. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, do you see what that woman over there did? That, that woman there, did you see what she just did? Everybody else contributed out of their abundance, carefully calculated so they wouldn't give more than what they needed to, but she was different. She gave all that she had. I tell you, her offering was greater than everyone else's offering combined. Now, the disciples didn't really understand what Jesus was getting at, and frankly, neither do we. Her offering would not make the least bit of difference in the temple operating budget, nor would it buy more candles for worship, nor would it buy more animals that could be sacrificed. No, her offering was not great by the standards of this world, but it was extravagantly generous by the standards of the heart. And remember, God does not look upon us as others look upon us, but rather God judges us by our heart. 
You see, everyone else gave out of the abundance. She gave out of poverty. Now, it must be understood at this point, nowhere in Scripture does Jesus ever advocate poverty. Nowhere in Scripture does Jesus say that there is a virtue in poverty. But those who gave out of their abundance had plenty left over. They could still live in their big houses. They could still wear fine clothes. They could still take luxury vacations if they were so inclined. They did not have to give anything up. They did not have to sacrifice any of their wants or their desires or their wishes. They still had more than enough. But she, well, Jesus knew that as soon as he heard her two small coins drop in the coffer, he knew that she would feel its effects for a long, long time. Because of her offering, she would have to do some reprioritizing of what she was going to do. She would have to do without some things. She would have to do without some comforts. She would have to do without some luxuries. But be that as it may, in her heart, she was a cheerful giver because she knew that she did the right thing. She knew that her offering that day, so long ago, reflected her commitment to God. Her offering was emblematic of her love. The epistle of 1 John says, We love God because God first loved us. Her offering, though small, was a response to the great, magnificent, divine, holy love that would never, ever let her go. The reason that Jesus called her gift the greatest gift was because it made the greatest difference, not in the workings of the temple, but in her life. It was an indication, a reflection of the sincerity of her commitment to do the work of God's kingdom. To God be the glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. I need to have Russell help me with a lavalier mic because uh, my battery died. Tim Carley is joining our congregation by reaffirmation of faith. Tim, in baptism, you were claimed by God, and you were marked as Christ's own child forever. You were joined to his body by the gift of the Holy Spirit. You come to us not as a stranger, but as a friend in Christ, a member of God's greater household. And we rejoice that you now desire to join with this congregation in the worship and the mission of this church. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. As members of the body of Christ, if you're able, I invite you to stand and reaffirm the faith into which we were baptized by either reading or reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father. You all may be seated. Tim, you come to us, as I said, as a brother in faith. And so I ask you, do you promise to support the, the mission and the ministry of the church, giving of your time and your, and your talents, and will you be a faithful disciple? If so, say, I will. 
I invite you all to join me in the spirit of prayer. Our Lord God, we ask that your Holy Spirit descend upon Tim and that fill him with all of your grace and power and wisdom. We ask that you walk with him and help him to feel your presence as he continues this walk of life in faith. We ask that you enable each and every one of us to remember our own baptisms and the promises that we made. We have been created in your image. From, from you have, we have come and unto you we shall return. In life and death we belong not to ourselves but to Jesus Christ who is our Lord and Savior. We offer prayers of thanksgiving for the discipleship of Tim. Amen. Welcome to this ministry. We have a couple things here for you. One is a baptism, not baptism, a membership certificate commemorating this day, and the other is a name tag. In life may you live to the Lord, and in death may you die in the Lord, so that in both life and death you may know that you always belong to the Lord. Amen. Let us all stand, not stand, but you may seat and join in singing our hymn of welcome, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Stand if able, and we'll sing our closing hymn.
Do not close your hymn books. We will be on 723. But I want to make a couple of uh, uh, announcements. One, I'm going to do a very short benediction, but prior to that, or in response to the uh, benediction that we will do together, since it's written in paragraph form, I'd like for us to alternate back and forth. I will begin with Almighty God. You pick up and make us always, and then we'll go back and forth. Also, at his funeral, Winston Chir- Sir Winston Churchill made the request that taps be played at the end of the service and that it be followed by revelry. Because Churchill, a man of great faith, did not believe that taps was the end of the story, did not believe that death would ever win, but there's always a day of resurrection. May the love of God that will never let you go, the peace of Christ that passes all human understanding, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that knits us together as the body of Christ here on earth. May these three things dwell in your hearts so that you may produce the fruit of the kingdom every day of your life. Would you now join me in the responsive prayer for the nation? Almighty God, you have given us this good land as our heritage. Make us always remember your generosity and constantly do your will. Bless our land with honest industry, truthful education, and an honorable way of life. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil course of action. Make us who come from many nations with many different languages a united people. Defend our liberties and give those whom we have entrusted with the authority of government the spirit of wisdom that there might be justice and peace in our land. When times are prosperous, let our hearts be thankful, and in troubled times, do not let our trust in you fail. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 